Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. It seems to me that there are as many candidates for Rookie of the Year this season as I've ever seen. Which one of the rookies in the West do you like, Tom? Well, the punter, right? Ray Guy. He kicks it completely out of sight. He's got almost a six-second hang job. Uh, a kicker may be the Rookie of the Year, Pat. I guess there's another one in Atlanta that has a pretty good chance. Nick Mickemeyer. He's really made a difference in that team. Might lead the league in scoring as a rookie, which uh, has a, an all-pro team, an all-pro rookie ever made it as a kicker? Not to my knowledge. I, I can't think of a time that a kicker has been the Rookie of the Year. And there's a receiver in New Orleans that has to get a little consideration, too, Jubilee Dunbar. Well, a name like that, you can't be all bad down in New Orleans, right? <laughs> but really, I think uh, as you look at the whole league, probably the rookies from that division are not as strong as some of the others. You think about Billy Joe Dupree and Charlie Young and, of course, Chuck Foreman. Chuck Foreman and also Chambers, the defensive tackle for the Chicago Bears. A good rookie year, though. Who would you pick right now if you had, had to make a choice? I think Foreman with Minnesota has contributed more to that team. We'll see most of those players in this week's show, as well as all the best action from last Sunday's games. And what about our featured performer of the week, Tom? Well, Pat, are you ready for this one? Our featured performers of the week in the West are plural, and I mean plural, the entire Denver Bronco team and their coach, Johnny Ralston. This footage is from last year, but last week, the Broncos were the first visiting team in 14 games to defeat the Steelers in Pittsburgh. The score was 23-13. And the Broncos are now undefeated in their last six games. You know, John Ralston came out of two consecutive Rose Bowl victories over Ohio State and Michigan and said, let's get the Broncos together, and he believes in that positive thinking. In fact, he was a Dale Carnegie instructor at Utah State and at Stanford, where his college record was 85-47-4. He's done some job. Salesmanship and gamesmanship. The Broncos are rough and they're young. It was brain versus brawn last Sunday as the positive thinking Denver Broncos attempted to think their way past the powerful Pittsburgh Steelers. In Pittsburgh, the saying goes that the defense is made of pure gold and with golden shoed Elsie Greenwood leading the Steel Gang defenders, their true worth was to be severely tested by the stampeding Denver Broncos. Having never lost to Pittsburgh in three outings, Denver was still considered the underdog as the Steelers had not lost at home in 13 games. If they were indeed underdogs, Denver never showed it. Tom Jackson forced the fumble, which Maurice Tyler recovered, giving Bronco signal caller Charlie Johnson a chance to show off his greasy kid stuff. Denver had to settle for three, allowing the Steeler offense to show what they could do if given a chance to move the ball. Making the biggest part of their yardage via the arm of Terry Hanratty, the Steelers moved in for the tie at three all. Both clubs exchanged offensive jabs as great individual efforts couldn't produce touchdown. Broncos forced Pittsburgh to settle for a field goal as Tom Graham met Henry Davis short of a first down. Floyd Little rallied Denver for the tie at half, and it was even at two field goals apiece. Denver took the lead as Little climaxed a 10-play drive to start the half. Not to be outdone, however, Hanratty brought the Steelers back on a 42-yard shot to number 25, Ron Shanklin. A repeat of the play shows the reason for the Pittsburgh score. On a square in, Shanklin found the seam in the zone, 
then behind a great brush block, found himself in the end zone. On the ensuing series, Broncos specialist Jim Turner used a lucky bounce to regain the Denver lead. Joe Dawkins then led the mile-high men goalward for an insurance tally, ripping off 25 big ones. With the momentum completely in favor of Denver, a short pass from Charlie Johnson to tight end Riley Odoms got the insurance score they needed. Trailing 23 to 13, Pittsburgh mounted a last ditch effort as Hanratty tried the screen to Franco Harris. But even Franco couldn't produce the magic needed to pull this one out. Hanratty's frustration signaled the end of Pittsburgh's home win streak while keeping AFC Western title hopes as a real positive possibility for the Denver Broncos. And so the Broncos are now undefeated in their last six games, and that's a remarkable streak for John Ralston's guys, Pat. And until last week, there was another remarkable streak in the AFC West, Tom. The mysterious San Diego Chargers had not won in seven consecutive games. Two weeks ago, Ron Waller took over as interim head coach of the San Diego Chargers. And as he says, he likes to plan something new for each game. Running and passing from a bewildering array of offensive formations, the Chargers sometimes confuse the Saints and sometimes themselves. The quarterback and or tailback was Wayne Clark, number 13. bizarre was the San Diego offense that even a flanker around play looked almost commonplace. Despite all the fancy stuff, the first touchdown came about on a special teams play. Former special teams coach Ronnie Waller couldn't have envisioned an easier score than the one the Saints allowed Ron Smith. This 84-yard gallop was his second punt return touchdown of the year and assured his place among the punt return leaders for the season. The Chargers' second touchdown was set up by the defense when Archie Manning sought out Bob Newland, but number 24 cornerback Bobby Howard intervened. The touchdown honors went to Robert the Tank Holmes, number 38. One ray of light for New Orleans was the combination of Archie Manning and tight end John Beasley, who combined 12 times. But it was not enough to derail the Chargers, who held on to win 17-14 for Ron Waller's first victory as the NFL head coach. Knowing that every game is important in the tight AFC Western race, the Kansas City Chiefs weren't about to let the Houston Oilers spoil the visions of playoff spots that were already dancing in their heads. The Houston Oilers weren't expected to pose any serious threat to the Chiefs' title hopes, but in the NFL, there's no such thing as a sure win, even against those dry well boys from Texas. The Oilers once rose to stop Kansas City short of a touchdown, as Houston turned back Mike Livingston short of six. On 
On offense, the Oilers managed a short dive by Fred Willis and a sure effort by number 36, Bob Gresham, for their only scores. The Oilers were to take a back seat once again this afternoon as Mike Livingston finally started the Chiefs' offensive engine. The six-year veteran hit on 13 of 19 for 149 yards, one going to rookie tight end Gary Butler for six points. Livingston, who has lost only two games ever as a starting quarterback for the Chiefs, found a high-stepping Otis Taylor for another score. With all of his receivers covered, the 6'4", 210-pounder showed some quickness, turning it up and taking the score in himself. On defense, the Chiefs have been strong all season, and against Houston, it was no different. The Redwood Forest swarmed Oilers signal callers three times during the afternoon for sacks. Lynn Dickey suffered two interceptions, one to number 63, Willie Lanier. The Honey Bears' 29-yard return set up a Willie Ellison touchdown several plays later. But in Houston's next possession, Lynn Dickey got a bad case of the Butterfingers. John Lohmeyer's recovery and return climaxed the chief onslaught, ushered in win number six of the season for Kansas City. And certainly Hank Stram had a lot to smile about as his Chiefs had scored a season's high of 38 points, while turning back Sid Gilman and his Oilers, who could put together only 14, while losing their 20th game in their last 21. Well, Tom, according to all the preseason prognosticators, the New York Giants were supposed to be in the heat of the battle for a playoff spot right about now. Well, that's true, Pat. Uh, the way the Giants swept undefeated through their preseason schedule, they had just about everybody convinced. But right now, the only team with a worse record in the league is the Houston Oilers. The New York Giants headed into their 1973 schedule with the clear understanding that they had an outside chance to win it all. But somewhere between the first and the tenth game, something went wrong. They slipped to a 1-7-1 and seven and one record. And what had been judged to be a good football team obviously was not. And prior to the Giants game with the St. Louis Cardinals at New Haven, Red Webster had to be the man most puzzled by the collapse of the New York Giants. But number 12, Gary Keithley of the Cardinals, was the man with the most immediate problems. For Jim Hart, the Cardinals' regular quarterback was injured early in the game. And St. Louis had to depend on Keithley, a raw rookie from Texas, El Paso. Actually, things were working out quite nicely for Keithley when Mel Gray stepped away with his 15-yard pass, turning it into an 80-yard play to give St. Louis a 10-3 advantage in the second quarter. But it was all tough sledding for the rookie after that as the Giants' defense closed in and put a stopper on the St. Louis attack. Meanwhile, the Giants' offense was heading into the same rough going, and number 11, Randy Johnson, the Giants' quarterback, came off the worst for this meeting with the Cardinals' Leo Brooks. In fact, Johnson suffered a concussion on this play and was forced to leave the game in favor of Norm Sneed. Johnson's bad luck was Sneed's and the Giants' good fortune, for from the beginning it was apparent that this was Sneed's day.
Snead's play selection reactivated the old kinship between Ron Johnson, number 30, and the Giants' front line. And using Johnson effectively, Snead engineered an 80-yard, 14-play drive with Johnson scoring on a short pop in the third period to make the score 10 all. In the fourth quarter, Snead gave to ex-Cardinal Johnny Rowland to cap a 79-yard sustained drive in nine plays. But the play that opened up the game was this 70-yard catch and carry from Snead to Ron Johnson. A repeat of the play gives us a look at the way things were supposed to be in New York this year, with Snead nibbling away, conservatively controlling the ball with short passes, and boom, Ron Johnson turns it into six. And if that scenario didn't quite work out for the Giants this season, at least it worked out last week for the fans in New Haven as the Giants rolled to victory over the Cardinals 24-13. A few weeks ago, the Philadelphia Eagles upset the Dallas Cowboys 30-16. Statements of revenge filtered out of Dallas all last week. But when the game began, the Bose and the Cowboys fell flatter than a pancake. Right from the start, the Eagles' defense made mincemeat of the highest-scoring team in the NFL. And on the first possession of the second quarter, quarterback Roman Gabriel found Charles Young in the seam of the Dallas zone. The Rookie of the Year candidate blazed 80 yards to give Philadelphia a stunning 10-0 lead. But minutes later, the Eagles' optimism and morale wilted when Roman left the game after his right arm collided with Jethro Pugh's helmet. With Gabriel absent, the Cowboys blew out the Eagles on the sure hands and flying feet of Walt Garrison, number 32. On the day, Garrison rushed for almost 90 yards of the club record 286 that Dallas churned out against Philadelphia. After a nifty play action fake, Roger Staubach connected with Garrison and Dallas led 14-10. The Eagles seemed back in the game when linebacker John Sadaski intercepted a Staubach pass. But Sadaski's lateral to Marlon McKeever was re-stolen by Billy Joe Dupree. Given that break, Dallas decimated the Eagles. On a delay pattern, Staubach hit Bob Hayes streaking against the grain. The goal line, rookie safety Randy Logan met Hayes one-on-one -on -one and lost. Trailing 21-10, John Reed stood in for Gabriel and attempted a short passing attack. His shortest pass traveled but three yards and nestled into the surprised hands of defensive end Pat Toomey. The Cowboys salted the game away on a 54-yard burst by Robert Newhouse. Tucked snugly behind all-pro guard John Nyland, number 76, Newhouse rambled to the one-inch line. Walt Garrison's second touchdown rounded out the revenge match as Dallas won handily, 31-10. Well, like fans in most cities, Pat, the Redskins faithful are unhappy with the quarterback position. Most times, Tom, a few victories will keep the fans quiet. But in Washington, while the team rarely loses, the quarterback never seems to win. The divided loyalties in Washington spurred on the Baltimore Colts, who tore apart Billy Kilmer like a Thanksgiving Day wishbone.
At times, Billy's floaters hung up a split second too long in the rarefied air of RFK Stadium. While touchdowns seem non-existent in Washington these days, so too are the brilliant runs of Larry Brown, who for the 10th straight week was bundled up and wrapped tight like a Christmas present by the defense. While Washington slumbered, the frisky Colts kicked up their heels and caught nothing but air. When Baltimore double teamed the Redskins front four, linebacker Chris Hanberger blew in free and easy and untouched on blitzes. Finally, the accusing finger of guilt pointed to quarterback Marty Domries, who threw right into Redskin coverage. The alert over the hill gang pulled the old Brig Owens to Ken Houston to Brig Owens play, and it worked to perfection. Finally, Billy aired out his soggy arm and speared Roy Jefferson, who sliced neatly between Colt linebacker and cornerback. The long gainers and touchdowns were the exception, as Washington's 22 points resulted from five Kurt Knight field goals and a lone six-pointer by Larry Brown. The lowly Colts managed two touchdowns, the last coming on a brilliant catch by Cotton Spire. But it was too little and too late, as Baltimore fell to Washington 22 to 14. We'll be, right, we'll be right back with the second half of This Week in Pro Football following station identification. Well, Pat, when the Bengals and the Jets met last Sunday, you might have thought the game would have been somewhat overshadowed by the nostalgia surrounding the final meeting of retiring coach Weeb Eubank and Paul Brown, an association that dates back to the 1920s. That surely wasn't the way it turned out, though, Tom. As a matter of fact, the last we saw of the 66-year-old Weeb Eubank, he was chasing after those referees following the conclusion of a very controversial game. The Bengals sprang to a big lead last Sunday, thanks in part to the cat-like cruising of number 19 Essex Johnson. And when Essex wasn't on the prowl, his 240-pound running mate, Booby Clark, was busy gouging out 72 yards in the game's first score. Obviously, Cincinnati quarterback Ken Anderson had his eyes on a 17-0 advantage. 
And despite a warning by Jet cornerback number 20, Dallas Howell, that wide receiver Isaac Curtis was leaving his zone, Anderson was not to be denied. The result was a seam-splitting six-pointer for the San Diego State product Isaac Curtis, who in his first year is one of the AFC's top five receivers. But on the next series, Al Woodall, hitting six for seven, piloted the Jets 77 yards for the six-pointer to Jerome Barkham. At the start of the second half, Woodall was blazing away again. This time, it was a volley to tight end Rich Castor, 37 yards downrange. Two plays later, the Bengals had themselves a contest as Woodall dropped back and locked in on Castor again, who, with some fast shuffling, was awarded the score. But as the game wore on, despite his 20 completions for 212 yards, Woodall began to wilt under the mauling bingo rush. And the stage was set for the triumphant return of Joe Namath, absent since his injury last September 23rd. With a little under two minutes remaining in the score of Jets 14, Bengals 20, Joe started to do his thing. Eddie Bell was the receiver, and suddenly the Jets and Joe Willie were making believers once again. But as close as it was, last Sunday fell well short of the second coming, as first Rich Castor was ruled out on a judgment call. The squabble was just beginning, however, as two plays later, it was a Castor controversy once again. A repeat shows just how close a call can get. Was Castor over the goal when he made the reception or not? So much for controversy. When in doubt, there's always one place you can look for sure. The Browns and Raiders met last Sunday in the Oakland Coliseum with identical five three and one records and playoff plans, Tom. That's right, Pat, and while it didn't turn out to be a high scoring game, it certainly was a ferocious one. Although there were no serious injuries in the game, there were any number of devastating collisions. Monopolizing that aspect of the game was the Cleveland Browns defense who seemed to absorb anyone wearing black. And when the gang tackling failed, it was back to the big hit. Unable to advance beyond their own 49-yard line in the first half, the Raiders seemed to be getting picked on by everyone. It seemed, even if an Oakland play developed well, it was inevitably earmarked for yet another divot in the Coliseum turf. Kenny Stabler was sacked five times on a day which was filled with nothing but frustrations for the capricious Raider offense. Only by the virtue of a fourth quarter turnover were Stabler and crew able to move within field goal range to avoid the shutout. But just as the Oakland offense fizzled, so did the Browns on all but one game determining march during which Mike Phipps emerged to supply the needed drive. Twice he connected with veteran receiver Frank Pitts, number 25, for first downs and good yardage.
Then the get with it quarterback dropped back and hit number 44, Leroy Kelly, on the Oakland 11 yard line. And by that time, Oakland Cleveland relationships were at a new low. One play later, Phipps lobbed a perfect pass to number 43, Fair Hooker, for the game's only touchdown. A repeat shows all pro Willie Brown had his back turned and never knew where the ball was when Hooker made the reception. The win gives Cleveland a good shot at the AFC Central title and leaves Oakland a shocked and battered third in the West. Last week in Foxborough, Massachusetts, the New England Patriots took on the Green Bay Packers in a free-scoring affair in which Jimmy Plunkett unloaded a cluster of pinpoint passes. With only five wins between them, you somehow felt that neither the Packers nor the Patriots could win this game. New England tried early to give it away, and their fumble eventually proved costly. With Jerry Taggy starting at quarterback, the Packers went with short passes to their running back, John Brockington, who turned them into sizable gains. Brockington then put the pack ahead on a scoring sweep that capped an 80-yard drive. Green Bay increased its lead to 14-zip when Perry Williams took it in from six yards out, and it looked like the Packers were in a cakewalk. The only thing that kept the Patriots close was the foot of Jeff White, who lucked one in and kicked three other field goals for the afternoon. Taggy to number 22, John Staggers got the Packers in close enough for a Chester Marcold field goal, and their cushion got fatter. Green Bay continued to dominate the game as number 48, Ken Ellis, slipped in, intercepted, and popped free for 47 yards and a 24-9 lead. But then the Patriots' defense shut down the end zone. Number 27, Ron Bolton, stopped this threat, and everyone wanted a hand in the congratulations. The play must have been inspirational, because from that point on, the Patriots took Green Bay's best shots but came right back. Number 42, Mac Heron took one wallop, but was there to haul in this Jim Plunkett pass and barge his way goldward. Then Jim Plunkett spotted his tight end, Bob Windsor, and Windsor zigged into the end zone with a block by Reggie Rucker, number 33, to bring the Patriots to within five at 24 to 19. Jim Plunkett continued his best day as a pro as he hit for 348 yards passing, including this 63-yard score to Reggie Rucker. He also scored a one-yarder himself and turned his Patriots around to win 33 to 24. Although it was only win number three for Plunkett and the improving New Englanders, they were glad to avoid the short end of the score as well as the seller in the AFC East.
Correct me if I'm wrong, Pat. The Miami Dolphins continue to roll as last week they shut out the once contending Buffalo Bills. You are correct, Tom. And after <laughs> 10 games, the Dolphins have allowed less points, 94, than any team in the NFL. That is some defense. In Buffalo, the latest dance craze is called Miami Grew the Oranges, but Buffalo Got the Juice. Last week, the juice poured through Miami for 120 yards on 20 carries and a six yard per try average, which was only second best on his own team. First best for Buffalo was number 34, Jim Braxton a punishing bruiser who had 119 yards rushing and a seven yard average. The Dolphins countered this firepower effectively with the wing-footed wonder Mercury Morris. And although Merck didn't break this one, he did move the aqua and orange in close enough for one of Larry Zonka's shorties. Then for aesthetic taste, Bob Greasy unlimbered one to tight end Jim Mandich. Greasy followed with a pretty pass to Paul Warfield to put Miami up 17 to nothing. Despite all of Buffalo's running crunch, when they went to the air, they encountered drive-killing trouble. Sometimes their pass plays never even got off the ground thanks to the likes of number 84, Bill Stanford. In fact, the Miami stoppers were so potent that Buffalo never got on the scoreboard in the 17 to nothing defeat, which just about finished their playoff aspirations. For Miami, it was the win that clinched the division title. While for this bedraggled Buffalo, the chips were definitely down. In the NFC Central, the battle is, of course, no longer for first place, but for second place. And last week, when the Detroit Lions and the Chicago Bears met for the 79th time, there was something different about the atmosphere at Soldier Field. There was definitely something strange about the look of things because for the first time in four seasons, Chicago was without its number one bear, Dick Butkus. But the typical lion-bear catfight was as wild as ever. Under the leadership of Bobby Douglas, the Bears enjoyed brief success when Carl Garrett scored in the first quarter. In the second quarter, the brawny Douglas was forced out of the game with a gimpy leg, and the Chicago fans got a chance to cheer for their new young hope at quarterback, rookie Gary Huff, number 19. Earl Garrett kept a bear drive alive, and it seemed that Gary Huff was about to become the new hero of the Windy City. But then, with plenty of time, Huff fell prey to a rookie mistake. Number 26 rookie free safety Dick Geron had free sailing 95 yards the other way, and Huff and the Bears were never the same. 
Jerron, who broke Calvin Hill's rushing records at Yale, collected the first three interceptions of his pro career in his first year on defense since high school. In all, Gary Huff's first extended service in the pros resulted in a disappointing 12 completions in 27 attempts, four interceptions, two of them by the rejuvenated middle linebacker Mike Lucci, number 53. On offense for Detroit, Algy Taylor, number 42, had another big day, 106 yards on the ground. Billy Munson runs a balanced offense, and Algie Taylor is the guy who keeps the defense honest. Munson also passed for two touchdowns, both times to Larry Walton, and both times Walton was quite alone for the score. Bill Munson led Detroit over Chicago 30 to seven. And for the 10th time in 11 tries, the Bears just could not keep up with the Lions. It's pretty unusual for a team to go from the division championship to the division seller in one year, wouldn't you say so, Tom? Well, I agree with you, Pat, but the way it looks right now, that's exactly what's happening to the San Francisco 49ers. As last week, the Los Angeles Rams gave them yet another push down the coal chute. The festive atmosphere in the Los Angeles Coliseum last week was symbolic of the Rams season thus far. On tap was an easy touch in the faltering 49ers. The Rams' defense came out smoking and crunching, and poor number 19, Joe Reed, took the brunt of the punishment. Then L.A. tracked down number 22, Vic Washington, and gave him more of the same. And while the Ram defense was tough, the offense was even tougher. Jim Bertelson looked like he was stopped, but broke free and ended up with a 44-yard gain. John Hadel then dropped back and zapped a 25-yarder to the ever-elusive Harold Jackson. The Los Angeles defense continued to pop in occasionally, this time in the person of number 47, Charlie Stoops, whose interception set up another Ram score. And although this looks like a clean six for the Hadel jackson combo, it was no go. As the replay shows, John Hadel had crossed the line of scrimmage before he threw, and L.A. had to settle for a field goal. But Hustle and Harold soon got back the one they took away, and the Rams led 17-3. Then number 30, Lawrence McCutcheon, powered Los Angeles toward another score on a good second effort play. Jim Bertelson's five-yard scamper made it all academic as he gave his team a 24-6 advantage. And what better way to end the day that made their record eight and two than with an easy 57-yard hookup between the ever-dangerous John Hadle and Harold Jackson duo. Final score, 31-13 Rams.
Well, Pat, it's prediction time, and we have to do it, right? Yeah, you're 27 and 28, and I'm 35 and 20. And my father told me never to play conservative. Okay. So I'm going to take some chances. All right. Wait till I tell you what my dad told me. Go ahead. Pittsburgh at Cleveland. <laughs> what did he tell you before I picked? Uh, he, talk, he told me to pick Pittsburgh. <laughs> okay, I think I'll go with Cleveland then. Okay, Pittsburgh to beat Cleveland. That's a good one. How about Atlanta at the New York Jets? Maybe a surprise here. Could be. Uh, Joe Namath is supposed to be back. His arm is still a little bit sore, I understand, but he's supposed to start this game, and they do strange things when he's their quarterback, so I'm going to pick the Jets to upset the Falcons. Good. Atlanta, I'll take the Falcons now. Okay, Kansas City at Denver. That's not going to be an easy one. The first match, uh, as I recall, was at Kansas City, and the Chiefs won 16-14, but Denver is really rolling. Uh, I'm going to pick the, the Broncos to win at home. Boy, I think Ralston has one of the best young teams in football. What have they won, five in a row now? Something like that, and uh, Charlie Johnson is really having a good year. Uh, they can take over the lead from Kansas City uh, if they can win this game. I think I'll pick Kansas City then. Did you change? Yes. Okay, I'll stay with the Broncos. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens in all of those games, as well as all the rest of the action around the NFL. I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week. I changed on you, didn't I? Brought to you by West Clocks, a division of General Time, a tally industries company. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western Motels. There are over 1,250 Best Western Motels located in more than 900 cities throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And by American Airlines. If the sun is shining there, chances are American flies there. From the Caribbean to California to the South Pacific, American Airlines to the good life. Program materials for this week in pro football travel via REA Air Express.